Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listeners. And thanks to all of you, including Peter Bohawk, Philip Less, Howard Yermish, and we've got three new patrons, Derek, Mickey, and Charles. Welcome to you. Yay! On this episode of DTNS, Google announces some long-awaited updates. Microsoft may not be peachy keen on that whole Apple and OpenAI coziness. And how can AI breathe real new life into news? Or can it? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, May 30th, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. From deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And um, the show's producer, Roger Chang. We have a good show for everyone today. Uh, sometimes it feels like you can't get away from AI news, but we've got a good spin. Got a good spin on some AI stuff in the mm -hmm. show. So stick with us. And let's start with the quick hits. The Amazon Fire TV AI-powered search feature, which was first announced at the company's devices event last September, is coming to the U.S. with Fire TV devices running Fire OS 6 or later. It's powered by a proprietary large language model and understands natural languages, natural language and phrases, and can answer specific queries like, what movie has the line, life is like a box of chocolates? Although, if you don't know the answer, I don't know where you've been. It can also Call pull fiction. up options based on actors, characters, genres, topics, the like, and will be able to suggest titles, including streaming services that users already subscribe to. We touched on this briefly in Wednesday's show, but here's a little more. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman sources say that Apple is seeking a senior engineer to help build a television and sports app for Android, a sign that the company is bringing Apple TV Plus to the rival smartphone platform. Apple has an Apple TV app for Android TVs, but Android phone and tablet users are forced to access the service via the web. In its job listing, Apple said it's looking for someone to lead the development of fun new features and help build an application used by millions to watch and discover TV. TV and sports. Mm, interesting news. Two former Priceline executives and co-founders of HotelsbyCity.com have launched a global travel booking platform called Planin, like planning, but without the G, I guess, that empowers creators to monetize their hotel recommendations and share travel-focused content, as if... Influencers on Instagram weren't bad enough. Creators can earn income with Planin by sharing an affiliate link across social platforms when they tell their audience about their latest trip, what hotels they might have liked or didn't like, and post uh, photos of their travels as well. Planin offers creators a 5% lifetime commission, meaning they receive commissions for any trip that a user books through Planin as long as that user account actually exists. Upgradable laptop maker framework is taking pre-orders for its next generation of swappable main boards to give you access to an Intel Core Ultra processor. The company is also upgrading the webcam for $39 and replacing the 60 hertz 2256 by 1054 screen with a brighter high resolution variable refresh rate 120 hertz 2880 by 1920 panel at 256 PPI for $269, both of which can be upgraded without upgrading the main board. The Core Ultra Board comes with a larger battery and new camera by default with the improved screen as an optional $130 upgrade. Framework is also opening pre-orders up for an SD card slot with the purchase of a laptop. New parts and laptops ship in August. Just a day after the U.S. Department of Justice announced that it had led an international effort codenamed Endgame to shut down the 911S5 proxy botnet, believed to be the world's largest botnet yet, Thursday, the European Union's justice and police agencies have taken down computer networks responsible for spreading ransomware through infected emails and in what they call the biggest ever international operation against this type of cybercrime. The European Union's Judicial Cooperation Agency, Eurojust, said Thursday that four high-value suspects have been arrested and that the agency took down more than 100 servers and seized control of over 2,000 internet domains. All right, everybody, let's go to Google's release party, shall we? I haven't been to a party in a while. I'm ready. Uh, <laughs> this release party is, is really just, you know, releases of several new updates, but we can make it a party. It's a party for some of you, uh, especially if you're in the Google and Android ecosystem. Uh, several new features and updates to make Android devices and services more useful. The big one that's getting the most chatter 
is that Google Messages will now let users edit messages up to 15 minutes after that message has already been sent. To do so, it's pretty explanatory. You tap and hold on sent RCS message, you select pencil icon appearing at the top of the screen for the edit, you make the edit, you resend. The Google Messages update starts rolling out today for all phones running Android 8 or later. You know, I know this sounds like kind of a minuscule upgrade, but when this came to iMessage, which is what I use primarily uh, to text, although I, I use WhatsApp depending, you know, on, on who I'm talking to, if somebody's traveling or whatever, um, this is a game changer. I don't always care. You know, maybe I've made like a very simple typo and I know that the person on the other side will get it and it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But sometimes the message is a little bit more important and to be able to edit it, especially if, if, you know, I, I might sort of like, I know I'm awake and they're not awake yet. I just edit, you know, I just make it cleaner. The whole experience is cleaner. I, I love this. So, you know, congrats to you, Google message users. I'm a fan. Uh, you know, I do use uh, Google Messages. I'm a you know fan of RCS, and it is kind of annoying when you send a message to someone, and I, I tend to read the message right after I get done sending it instead of reading it before I send it. And it's like, oh crap, I spelled that wrong, or I didn't include a preposition, and it changes the entire sentence that you just wrote. So the fact that they're going to give you you know 15 minutes to to go and make these changes, I kind of like it. Uh, it's not just a good feature. It's a necessary one. And it's not necessarily because people make mistakes. It's because autocorrect makes mistakes. That is the number one reason why either I have sent multiple messages to try to try to clear something up or I've had to edit messages. Uh, so we need technology to clean up the mess that technology has made for us. Yeah. I, um, one of, one of the, the most often things that I do, and I don't know, I've got like a trigger finger, um, especially because I'm almost always sending messages from a desktop experience where I'm using a keyword, but I will get halfway through a sentence and then, you know, hit the return. And I'm like, you know, like if it's a friend, if it's, if it's one of you guys and you know, you see me do that where I'm like, hi, I'm wanting to know about how you feel about the show tomorrow, you'd be like, okay, yeah, she's clearly right. in the middle of something or busy or whatever. But it's like, it makes me look weird when it's somebody I don't know as well. And that happens to me all the time. So I think there are a lot of little reasons why an edit button works really well. You see that something's edited. If you were suspicious about what the first version of the text was, follow it up with the, that, with the sender. That is such an overblown concern. I don't think that anybody in the real world believes that that is an issue, that we, we we think of that in a way to erode social trust. But as long as you can see the receipts, as long as there's a thing that shows you what it was before, this is really just a helpful thing that a lot of people understand is necessary in our modern world. Yeah, RCS wasn't the only thing that Google updated. They also announced improvements to Instant Hotspot, which will soon let users connect an Android tablet or Chromebook to their phone's hotspot without a password. The update also lets users switch between connected phones, tablets, or web browsers during Google Meet calls by tapping the cast icon. These features all start rolling out to Android phones, foldables, and tablets running Android 11 or later on June 10th. The Google Home Favorites widget is now available in public preview and can be added to the home screen on Android phones. And starting today, smartwatches running Wear OS 3 or later can now also run the Google Home Favorites tile with a new PayPal option for Google Wallet in the U.S. and Germany. Rounding out the announcements, Emoji Kitchen also getting some new sticker combinations on June 10th for users to share using Gboard. And digital car key support is being extended to cover some mini Mercedes-Benz and Polestar models. Uh, some mini models had already gotten this feature, but the digital key update is available for Android 12 or later and rolling out over the course of this next month. Now that I would be the most interested in, you know? Give me some digital car key support. I mean, you know, I I, I, read, I I rented a Polestar. It was very nice. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Polestar. I mean, it's it's. Yeah. I, I have a Volvo, so I I would assume that there's some stuff that's quite similar. Um, although the Polestar is more of the futuristic model, but um, but yeah, I uh, yeah. you don't see a, a lot of them out and about, or at least I don't. In in no, where, they in were my, they were part. amongst the. 
they're amongst the EVs that uh, Hertz has gotten stuck with, which has led to them uh, being in further financial ah, turmoil. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but that but that being said, no, it was it was it was a really uh, it was a cool car. It had a very interesting uh, on screen display where normally you have your your side console. They used a lot of their center console for the big screen, so your map. Uh, when plugged into Apple Maps or Google Maps, showed up right there, the large detailed one, and there was a smaller version down on the side, which that was an interesting design choice. You know, we were just having a conversation uh, the other day about, you know, whether EV sales have slowed um, because a lot of headlines would say that they have. Um, and, you know, the, the, the numbers don't really show that. They show that um, certain manufacturers are not selling as many EVs as before, but there are also just a lot of other companies in competition now. And uh, and perhaps being able to, you know, if you loved that Polestar experience, Justin, on your latest, you know, rental car journey, mm -hmm. um, you'd be even more inclined to get that car. I mean, I've, yeah. I've had a lot of rental cars in the past where I'm like, if I could afford this, I would get this car. I like this car. So I think... One of the things with EVs, they haven't slowed now. They just haven't picked up where I think a lot of the companies are expecting them to. So they're not selling as many, even though they're still selling a lot, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Well, Apple has said to be wrapping up negotiations with OpenAI to use OpenAI's chat GPT technology in upcoming iOS 18. This is widely expected to be announced in some form at WWDC, which kicks off June 10th, so less than two weeks from today. A new report from the information says that those discussions have been going on since mid-2023 and starting to scare Microsoft a little bit, since Microsoft also relies on OpenAI technology for its own co-pilot um, and other uses. It's also you know, a large investor in OpenAI itself. The OpenAI Apple deal is expected to be shared in some form, again, you know, going forward with iOS 18, exactly how it's going to make Siri way better than Siri used to be. We do not know yet. Many of us are hoping and praying that it's you know very dramatic, but Apple has been working on new AI-based features for its operating systems, and OpenAI looks to be playing a big role, powering some of those features. Apple was also reportedly talking to Google uh, about partnering with Google. Doesn't mean this that wouldn't happen in some form, but it looks like OpenAI is going to be the big partner at least for 2024. The two companies, Apple and OpenAI, um, that uh, it does put uh, Apple and Microsoft's uh, uh, deal uh, also in potential new competition. Microsoft might say, well, I mean, now if iOS 18 is just the best ever, then who's, you know, going to buy our phones? So I don't know. I, 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 I feel like this is Microsoft's game to lose at this point. I think that Microsoft may have just a tad bit concern, but I, overall, I think that Microsoft is probably going to be good because they, they do a lot for open AI. A, a lot of that stuff runs in Microsoft's cloud, which is a boon for Microsoft. I think where, uh, you know, th there's going to be a lot of consternation, a lot of concern and a lot of people running around right now is at Google, because although OpenAI does not do search yet. We know it's coming. So you now have a platform that has built into its operating system a, you know, an integration with ChatGPT, which is in direct competition with Google, who gives Apple five billion dollars or more a year to be the default search engine. If I were at Google, I'm sitting here thinking, how on earth did we lose this to this company? Um, you, you know, we, I would think that Google would have just backed up a Brinks truck and said, how much do you need in order to make sure that you're using us instead of this competitor of ours? I don't think they could have done it, uh, Rob. And, and there was reports that, that Apple was talking to Google. I don't think that you could have materially made the deal to say that we're going to put Gemini technology on here because then you are essentially taking away any competitive advantage that you might have had over the key technological difference difference over the next 10 years with Android phones. That would have been a real step back. For Apple's decision, it was either to partner with somebody else or to just wait until their own technology can get good, which 
at that point means them buying somebody else. This is a sign that Apple was behind the times and has to go shopping for this technology to be good. But I don't think that Microsoft is going to be all that mad about it. Number one, Microsoft is not just an investor in OpenAI. Microsoft is the money behind their compute, which is the reason why OpenAI is OpenAI. They have made a lot of really smart decisions in terms of the product they built, but the big reason why they are a larger differentiator is because they went to Microsoft, said, we need a gigantic computer, and each time they've needed to do it, they have built a bigger and bigger whale, as uh, was, was explained by Microsoft uh, during their keynote a few weeks ago. The one thing that I think is really interesting was in the year of our Lord 2024, we don't have the same kind of blood feuds that we once had in tech. Apple, Microsoft has long since gone dormant. We've seen uh, Google and Facebook once very much at odds, you know, at least reach some level of detente. <laughs> even a uh, 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 Google Facebook and, and Twitter. Remember that whole thing? Facebook yeah. and Twitter, right? Nobody even the compares one, the two anymore. The one for real blood feud that burns as hot as it ever has to this day is Microsoft's hatred for Google. They hate, hate, hate Google. And if they can stab this uh, spear right in their heart, and indeed, as Rob introduced, put maybe it's distant in the horizon. But this is an iceberg for AdWords. If they can put that on the radar of Google, I think that they are popping champagne bottles in Washington state. Hmm. I just want to know how, um, and Eileen Rivera and I talked about this on our latest uh, episode of, of Apple Vision show is, okay, so we're all excited about, you know, the big AI announcements, but what do we want? And she and I were both like, I don't know. <laughs> We don't, you have to tell us what we want, Apple, which is a funny thing because Apple sometimes does that even when the consumer did not ask for Apple to do it that way. But I don't know. I, I know what Siri is good at and I know what Siri is not good at right now, assuming that this would be bundled into a better version of Siri and not called something different. Maybe it would be. Uh, but if it's, you know, just like hyper Siri, better than ever, it's like, what what does it do? Uh, because I I think I've... I've been burned so many times. And I'm not just talking about Siri in general. I'm talking about Amazon's assistant, which I use around the house yeah. um, uh, predominantly. Uh, you know, I know how to ask for things a certain way. If I screw it up a little bit, it confuses the whole system. And then I go, ah, that's on me. I should have done it differently. You know, but can we get to a point uh, where these these tools really are just simply better? Yeah, I imagine that never happens. That's That's the promise. Imagine that every time that you phrase something awkwardly, it says, eh, it sounds like you, do you really want this? As opposed to, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. Yeah. I found something on the web for you. You're like, yeah. oh God, yeah. I could have done it myself. <laughs> Uh, well, we've been talking about all things uh, Google, Apple, OpenAI, but uh, if you are not listening to Android Faithful and you were interested in the announcements uh, that Google made that we talked about earlier on the show, you should Definitely listen to Android Faithful because the host aficionados, Ron Richards, Huan Tui Dao, Michelle Rahman, and Jason Howell bring you the latest Android news and information each week. And they go on a real deep dive into everything. It's just a great show. You can watch it live. They do it live at Tuesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. That's at YouTube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. And you can subscribe to the feed at AndroidFaithful.com. <laughs> Last December, the New York Times published a story titled Silicon Valley Confronts a Grim New AI Metric. In it, author Kevin Roos details the rise of P-Doom, or probability of doom statistic, a measurement of the likelihood AI will directly cause or create a cataclysm that threatens humanity with extinction. Fast Company explains the scale goes from 1 to 100, with 100 being near certainty that AI will eliminate humanity. Roos goes on to detail the challenging or should say the challenge of measuring P doom and, pos uh, and posits that P doom might be better as a Rorschach test that gives a better insight to the individual than the probability of human extinction. <laughs> On a uh, slightly uh, more positive note, uh, OpenAI has signed deals with Vox Media and The Atlantic, just another two uh, publishers uh, that help expand training data partnerships. 
OpenAI is kind of on a roll here. No details were released, no financial details certainly, but are expected to be similar to the ones that OpenAI previously signed with News Corp, Axel Springer, Dot Dash Meredith, The Financial Times, The Associated Press. Uh, you know, more and more, this is... Open AI is, you know, doesn't have them all, but but definitely definitely getting um, quite the uh, quite quite the umbrella. So, Justin, in the coming weeks, are we going to see um, some sort of sea change in how news journalism works? Because I know that you've been you've been following it closely. We all work in journalism anyway, but uh, following it closely, and you know, wondering if if it uh, if it needed a boost. <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned it like that because yes, we do work in journalism, but ironically, we work in the safe journalism sector now, the one that is directly funded by you, the listener, as opposed to relying on advertising, which used to be the safe journalism and now is increasingly more perilous real quick let me go back to p doom for a second i think that these stories are related because there is this tinge of apocalypse that is coming along with ai and you've seen a lot of this with the former open ai board member helen toner who's spoken out for the first time about all of the kerfuffle that happened last fall when it came to sam altman and the general idea that ai will end us now I'm not here to say that anything on God's green earth may or may not eventually contribute to our doom and demise, but I do find it interesting that we do have a lot of philosopher kings that are wandering around in this industry and just loudly proclaiming that this is something so dangerous it can't see the light of day, when in many cases, some of the issues that they are complaining about could be done with JavaScript, uh, let alone the technology that we're dealing with now. That being said, with all that that comes along with it, all the instability that could possibly come along with AI in terms of our modern economy, you have the people who buy ink by the barrel full, and, and that is uh, journalists, the scribes, uh, of which I would consider myself one, and I have many, many friends in this industry. I think that the hype, and I would say more specifically, fear around deals that OpenAI is making with some of these companies is a little bit overblown for two reasons. First, there's PTSD on the deals that Facebook made back in the tens that here's a gigantic, a, a gigantic check Washington post, please direct a lot of your attention to creating a Facebook page for which we will drive infinite traffic. Oops. We don't care about you anymore. We've now captured your audience. We've got what we want and now we don't care. So the money is going to stop. And uh, uh, after a quick pivot to video, we will discard any need for you, the actual journalists of the world. I get that. I understand that that was a very painful moment. I don't think it comes in a vacuum, nor do I think that Facebook took advantage of newspapers. Newspapers had been a very arrogant industry for a very long time that have toddled their way into these La Brea tar pits and in a lot of cases, I think, deserve to become fossils. OpenAI is not Facebook. They are not asking to change where the audience interacts with their product. It is downstream of the content that they create. Is it worrisome that maybe OpenAI will be a place where people go for news in the future? Sure, but that just means that they're every other competitor that you would ever run into, and this competitor wants to pay you money along the way. More than that, the desire for OpenAI is to have engaging writing that, on a plus side for places like The Atlantic, has a subscriber base. That means that for you to be a beneficial partner to them, you just need to create high quality product that your audience wants to engage with. That's more aligned with creating good work than anything that Facebook ever did, which just wanted to push people into creating more lists, more clickbait, and more slideshows. Mm -hmm. I think that in a world where advertising is falling apart, this is good money, and it doesn't ask the outlets to do anything that's particularly negative. I agree with you wholeheartedly, Justin. I, you know, I, I think that you know when I look at these deals, and I look at what Facebook did. F Facebook wanted to be. This is how you get to that data. 
where OpenAI just like we just we just don't want you to sue us when we use it to train our algorithms. Yeah, we're still going to send people where you know you know where you are. So one, as you said, if if you write good stuff and you're on the Atlantic, people still need to go buy a subscription to the Atlantic to go get that good stuff. OpenAI is not getting in the way of that. They just want to use that good stuff to make their stuff better when you ask questions and it pattern matches against all the words that have ever been written in, in, in known history. So I think that when you look at it like that, as you say, it's, it's a very different type of model for open AI because they're not trying to be the destination where they keep you inside of a walled garden. I think at least right now, because this could change in, in, you know, as fast as AI is moving, this could change in two months, three months, six months, whatever, you know, whatever the case is. But I think right now what they're really doing, what they're really trying to do is just not be sued in order to get access to that really good stuff, that really good writing that's going to ultimately help their algorithm give answers to questions that people ask in a much better way. Yeah, I, I, I don't see uh, financial stuff, you know, behind the curtain aside, because, you know, I, I don't know what what kind of deals OpenAI has made with with each of these publishers. But um, but just as far as content goes, I, and Justin, I thought that you, you, you laid that out really well, that you're you're not asking the publisher to do anything particularly, you know, clickbaity or under the standards of the high journalistic integrity that they've always stood for. It's really just saying, Hey, we want to, we want to use your, your, your vast wealth of knowledge. And, and yes, as long as open AI in this case holds up, it's part of the bargain by saying, everyone's always going to be able to click through to the original article. This shouldn't um, be bypassing, um, you know, the, the clicks that you need, but also we're entering a post-click era. So, you know, these are the these are the kinds of partnerships that 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 you got to you got to at least try out. Yeah, well, they need money. Like, look, yeah. look at look, I, I don't think that it's crazy to look at a world in which everything that we used to know as the titans of journalism are gone, except for The New York Times and The Washington. Or sorry, the, the Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post is underwater in terms of uh, what they are making. It's being kept alive by Jeff Bezos. But. Uh, uh, there is a need for cash as advertising is in flux, let's say, uh, 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 charitably. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, uh, let's talk about uh, something a little bit different. Um, and that is some information that we got in response to a conversation we had in yesterday's show. And that's in the mailbag. <laughs> Michael writes in, I just listened to the episode with Scott Johnson about YouTube playables. That was the conversation we had with Scott about playable uh, video games that YouTube is serving up to some folks. I had some cognitive dissonance, says Michael. I'm a premium user and I mostly interact with YouTube on Android on my phone. I cannot encounter YouTube playables. They're in, I can't not encounter YouTube playables rather. They're in the video feed on my homepage. Every few games I get prompted to play a game instead. Uh, I've even played a few games and I didn't even know how to find them without the in-feed prompts. This is in response to Scott saying, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of buried. You know, is anyone playing YouTube playables? Sounds like Michael, whether or not he's enjoying them, uh, certainly sees them. You know, on the same topic, Anthony in Portland, Oregon writes, I'm a very heavy, very heavy YouTube user and almost solely watch YouTube rather than any other streaming service. And I've had access to the playables feature for months now. The playables feature has been showing up in the home feed like shorts have. And I think that they play a similar role. I don't play mobile games at all, but I do play a lot of indie and AAA games at home. And I've always found mobile games to be predatory or too transient to make me want to play them with the playables i've been seeing the obscure titles are a bad and i should say are bad knockoffs they've been filling more of a flash game niche they aren't amazing but made they are free without ads or in-app purchases i can see going through the utap ad while in line with watching is short of playing a few rounds of the stupid state i that io game instead of trying to read a book in the future maybe this will increase the youtube mind share in consumers so when they go home they'll watch longer videos it'll be interesting if it actually has an effect 
Yeah, I get what you're saying, Anthony. Anthony's saying, you know, these aren't great games, but if you're wanting to kill some time and it's being offered to you and this will, you know, drive you back to the YouTube platform, you know, when you get back home and have a little bit more time, makes perfect sense. Uh, They're there. I think that's kind of what he's saying. They're there and they're time killers. So it's one of those things to where you can kind of get sucked into them, even if you really didn't mean to get sucked into them. I mean, I play three New York Times games every single morning of my life. If I don't- Which ones, I, which ones? Wordle, Connections, and Strands. Nice, I, I don't play Strands, but those two. Strands I mean, I is fun, but they I, I have to play them in a certain order or, you know, mm. my, my morning's crazy. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you know, games, they'll hook you. Uh, Justin Robert Young, we're hooked on you. Uh, let hey. us know where we can keep up with your work when you're not with us. Uh, well, you can uh, follow me. We're not wrong is the podcast where me, Jen Briney, and Andrew Heaton join us or, or uh, join the show. Well, we are on the show. We are the show. We were in DC though, and uh, that episode is up uh, right now. Uh, our our conversation uh, in the nation's capital. So head on over there. We're not wrong wherever you find podcasts. Indeed. Patrons, the show continues. Stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. Uh, Laptop sizes, they're changing all the time. But this one we're talking about in a few minutes may further surprise and maybe even delight you. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com forward slash live. We'll be back tomorrow talking about this unique impact of AI on any publishers with Chris Mancini. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>